All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Learning and Teaching Black History in Ontario webinar, the seventh in our Strengthening Ontario's Heritage Network webinar series. My name is Allison Little, and I'm the Program Manager at the Ontario Historical Society. Today's webinar is hosted in partnership with the Ontario Black History Society and will be led by Dr. Brian Walls and Brittany Miles. So just a bit of information about the Ontario Historical Society, if you're not familiar with us. We're a nonprofit or corporation and registered charity, a non-government group founded in 1888, bringing together people of all ages, all walks of life, and all cultural backgrounds interested in preserving some aspect of Ontario's history. And now a few words from the president of the Ontario Black History Society, Rosemary Sadler. Uh, hello, I'm Rosemary Sadler. I'm the president of the Ontario Black History Society. As many of you know, the Ontario Black History Society was founded by uh, Dr. Daniel G. Hill, Wilson O. Brooks, Joan Kazmarski, Donna Hill, and a number of other educators in 1978. Uh, since one of the first um, accomplishments of the OBHS was to have February proclaimed as Black History Month with the City of Toronto. Since I've been the president of the uh, Ontario Black History Society, we've been able to have Black History Month celebrated in the province and in conjunction with uh, Jean Augustine, who was then Parliamentary Secretary, to have it declared across the country. So this uh, in coming uh, years, um, 19, uh, 2015 and 2016, mark the 20th anniversary of the passage of Black History Month, uh, the, the, the National Declaration of February is Black History Month, and um, the first national celebration of February is Black History Month. Uh, aside from February, which uh, we, we look upon as being the culmination of all things learned during the year, we're very, very pleased to be part of and to support this webinar focusing on African Canadian history. It's not something to be relegated only to February. It is something to be considered and studied and appreciated and discussed all through the year. And uh, with opportunities like this and um, potential future opportunities, uh, we truly hope that uh, more people will become knowledgeable and engaged with uh, the wonderful, diverse nature of African Canadian history. Um, for those of you who would also like to follow up with the OBHS, our um, web, you can check us on, our, we have a website, we have a Facebook site, <clears throat> excuse me, and of course we, we can be reached um, by email and phone. And uh, that contact information can be provided to you, but I will leave you with only our phone number, which is 416-867-9420. Thanks so much. And enjoy the webinar. A bit about our webinar today. It'll start shortly. I'm just going to do a bit of technical support and introduce our speakers and then we'll head right into Brian and Brittany's presentation. So we uh, will have a few minutes at the end of the presentation for questions. You know, folks will be able to ask questions uh, using the webinar software today. Just a few things to go over on the technical side before we get started. In order to ask a question, you just type a question in the space provided below question in your menu bar on the right hand side. If you can't see that question space, you may need to expand the question section tab by clicking on it. You'll see a space with type a question for staff. That's where you write. So I'll be going over questions during the seminar. If there's a very common question that arises, I'll pass it on to Brian and Brittany so they can answer right away. But otherwise, the questions will be saved for the ends of the webinar. If you have a comment to share with the whole group, please feel free to use the chat window at the bottom of your webinar uh, menu. If you run into trouble during the webinar and you need my help, you can also use the raised hand button. It's a small yellow hand also in your menu. If you click it, a little hand will be raised next to your name and I can privately ask you what you need what I, and what I can do to help. If you're finding that the slides are moving really slowly or your audio keeps cutting out, try closing a few other programs. The more bandwidth you're using, the harder the webinar program has to work. If you lose your connection, try closing the webinar window and re-entering the room using the link you received in an email. Closing and restarting will usually solve the problem. Uh, a little bit about our presenters before we get started. We're joined today by Dr. Brian E. Walls. He's the founder of the John Freeman Walls Historic Site and Underground Railroad Museum in Puce, Ontario. 
He is the author of The Road That Led to Somewhere, based on a true story of his ancestor's journey on the Underground Railroad to Canada. Dr. Walls is a noted historian and lecturer on how the Underground Railroad can be used to teach math and science, anti-bullying, and little-known African diaspora history. He lectures on diversity and mutual respect at a police colleges, CO Bic Police College in Toronto, and Aylmer Provincial Police College. He partners with the University of Windsor and Toronto District School Board and Detroit District School Board in an annual African Diaspora Student Conference. And he's a member of the Order of Canada and the Order of Ontario and also a dental surgeon. <laughs> a little bit about our second speaker. Brittany Walls-Miles is a curator at the John Freeman Walls Historic Site and Underground Railroad Museum and is a graduate at the University of Windsor Jackman School of Dramatic Arts. She received her master's degree in elementary education at Niagara University where she was invited to join the Kappa Delta Pi and Kappa Gamma Pi International Honor Society in Education. She is accredited to teach in 48 states and in Ontario, and she is also, it bears mentioning today, Dr. Wall's daughter. All right, so I'm going to pass over control to Brittany, and she can get started. Hello, and good afternoon. My name is Brittany Walls-Miles, and I thank Mr. Robert Leverty, Alison Little, and the Ontario Historical Society for honoring us with this opportunity to encourage and hopefully inspire you to teach black history to your students in many creative ways. We would also like to thank the acclaimed author and president of the Ontario Black History Society, Mrs. Rosemary Sadler, for her support as well. And also you, the webinar audience, for your kind interest in this subject. We are here to share with you educational thoughts, unique resource materials, and information that will be useful in dynamically implementing black history especially as it relates to the Underground Railroad period and diversity education in the classroom. I'd like to call your attention to the image on the screen. This image is the theme poster of our museum. It is titled Equal Sisterhood and Brotherhood of Humankind, the Innocence of Youth. If history tells us anything, it tells us that we should have the mind of children born free of any prejudice. Black history education is not just ethnic education. It can allow your students to appreciate the importance of multiculturalism and diversity, combat bullying, reinforce the students' need to recognize modern-day enslavers such as hatred, drugs, violence, internet addiction, poor self-esteem, and the list goes on. It can also educate your students about the evolution of democracy and freedom and the fact that all humankind are part of that equation. The Underground Railroad Freedom Movement was the first great freedom movement in the Americas. It was the first time the good people, black and white, and of different races and faiths, work together for, in harmony for freedom and for justice. It can also be used to inspire more students to become interested in math and science or what, as we educators term, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. The John Freeman Walls Historic Site and Underground Railroad Museum, and the John and Jane Walls story, which we will expand on more in detail later, was proud to be chosen by NASA, the National Aeronautic Space Administration out of Washington, D.C., to be featured in a half-hour video titled The Underground Railroad Connections to Freedom and Science. This was produced by NASA to teach STEM education and to encourage minority students in the United States to be more interested in science, technology, and math. NASA used the basic fact that those black pioneers to Canada who traveled the Underground Railroad Freedom Routes followed the North Star Polaris in the sky and the side of the tree that the moss grows on to get to freedom. In, sh in the short time we have with you today, we cannot cover in one session the richness of all black history education. However, we will lay the foundation by focusing on the very important underground rural period of Ontario's African Canadian heritage. Again, we are here to share with you educational thoughts, unique resource materials, and information that can be made relevant to your students and your lives and our lives today. To do this, I will now welcome input from Dr. Brian Walls recipient of the Order of Canada in Ontario, author of The Road That Led to Somewhere, co-editor of Ontario's African-Canadian Heritage, a visiting and adjunct professor at Niagara University, Niagara Falls, New York, and founder of the John Freeman Walls Historic Site and Underground Railroad Museum, and also my father. Thank you, Brittany. 
The motto of the Order of Canada is Desiderantes Melorium Patrium. They desire a better country. And I cannot think of any better way to help create a better country than to have this opportunity today as a fifth-generation direct descendant of Travelers on the Underground Railroad than to encourage teachers, educators, and lovers of history to read more about and study the history and culture of others of the rainbow of humankind. Stories can connect us and enrich our lives. Sharing black history with your students must be taught with your heart as well as your mind. I personally feel and reflect on this that we, must, we have much to be thankful for, but various life circumstances and even global events can challenge us, both students and adults, and make us feel that we don't, when in essence, all we have to do is remind ourselves of what our ancestors went through and know that they have laid a foundation that we can build upon, and that is what progress is all about. This is why history education, black history education especially, is so important during difficult times. I also feel that students who are being taught black history education in Canada should be introduced to a hero of mine by the name of John Gray Simcoe, who was the first Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada, as Ontario was called. I was inspired by the story of Simcoe. Again, as I mentioned, stories can connect us. It connected me, because without Simcoe's courage, in my fam that my family may not have been here in Canada, now over nine generations later. Also, many of the immigration policies that allow for new Canadians to come to Canada, to immigrate to Canada today, can directly be traced back to John Gray Simcoe and his legislation. At the first legislative assembly in 1793 at Navy Hall, located in Niagara-on-the-Lake behind Old Fort George, Simcoe was a military leader and an abolitionist from England who was influenced by the great Wilberforce and other abolitionist-minded freedom fighters. Simcoe said in 1793, and I quote, there should no longer be discrimination in Upper Canada, as Ontario was eventually called, between those of African ancestry, European ancestry, and Native ancestry. Until then, there had been enslavement in Canada, which a lot of people don't realize. In fact, some of Simcoe's members of Parliament owned slaves, such as Matthew Elliott, who lived near Amherstburg, Ontario. So they resisted Simcoe's groundbreaking legislation, which narrowly passed. It said that any enslaved that was born after the legislation was passed in July of 1793 would be eventually freed at age 25. And any enslaved who crossed the 49th parallel onto Canadian soil would be immediately free. Therefore, finally, the enslaved seeking freedom had somewhere to run to and find safe haven. Like my ancestors, John Freeman Walls and Jane King Walls, and many, many others here in this great country called Canada. It is important to make your students aware of the fact that the immigration policy that we have today that allows Canada be, to be considered, certainly in the many major cities such as Toronto, a microcosm of the wider world, the roots of this diversity policy, as I call it, can be traced back to the abolitionist John Gray Simcoe and his sympathy towards an oppressed people, especially black freedom seekers, whose early pioneer traveling on the Underground Railroad before Canada was a country helped to lay a foundation that we can all build on. You, the teacher, you, the educator, 
can share the reflection with the class that for the first time in over a 300-year period since the explorers landed in the New World in 1492, and enslavement continued after that 50 years later for 300 years, that a leader with the power to do so said, enough is enough, and it ended enslavement in the New World, and that leader was our own John Gray Simcoe. Allow me to tangent and say that a dis discussion of the achievement of Simcoe can provide other teaching moments in Ontario black history. The early years, as this presentation could be subtitled. For example, teachers can tell their students that the first recorded black in Canada was Matthew da Costa, a genius in the learning and interpretation of First Nation languages, who in 1603 accompanied Champlain in his early exploring of our country. Matthew da Costa interpret the, interpreted the First Nation languages to the explorer, and the first recorded slave in Lower Canada, later to be called Quebec, was a six-year-old boy from Madagascar by the name of Oliver Lejeune. A research assignment, including the Simcoe period of history on up to the War of 1812, could follow. A lively discussion could take place regarding the Black Empire loyalists, details about Coley Cooley, and the historical icon Harriet Tubman could lay the foundation for a discussion of the importance of black history. Rosemary Sadler, as I mentioned earlier, has written a wonderful book about Harriet Tubman, who brought many freedom seekers to St. Catharines, including Tubman's own parents. The color core of Queenston Heights and the War of 1812 can round off other facts and dates about the beginnings, the early period of black history in our country, including, as I mentioned, the great underground railroad freedom movement, the first great freedom movement in the Americas, the first time good people, black and white of different races and faiths, worked in harmony for freedom and for justice. The abolitionist spirit was not only influencing John Graves Simcoe, but also influencing the thinking of leaders in the United States, but not as much as Canada as Simcoe had proved we as Canadians were leaders in North America in social justice matters, however not perfect. Black freedom seekers had to struggle for equality. Our students, through a study of the roots of black history, need to be made aware of this fact and be proud of it. You can proudly say to your students, newly arrived immigrants to Canada, and the lovers of history coming to your museums, that we stand on the shoulders of great men and women who have gone before. As educators, specifically teachers, it is up to us to make history come alive for our students, and in this case, specifically black history. We have to allow our imaginations to find creative ways in which to connect black history's somewhat heavy topic themes to their lives today. We can do this by doing something as simple as choosing various quotes or phrases that can be opened up to metaphoric symbolism and then by making history to self connections. For example, when I am teaching black history and underground railroad history, I like to focus on the theme of perseverance and the character traits of those who were a part of the Underground Railroad movement and relate those character traits to those of the students. To do this simply yet effectively, I choose the quote, we stand on the shoulders of great men and women who have gone before. I write this quote on the board and from there I lead a discussion on the positive character traits that we can emulate from those on the Underground Railroad. I will then ask each student to, in their notebooks, draw a picture of an Underground Railroad character. And I will do the same on the chalkboard. I will draw a picture of my great-great-great-grandfather, John Freeman Walls, who traveled on the Underground Railroad. From there, I will draw lines coming from his shoulders and his head with text bubbles on the end. 
I would then discuss which character traits he possessed that could help me succeed today. Character traits such as perseverance, courage, kindness, patience, and the list goes on. Each text bubble would then be filled in with a character trait. I would then allow my students to do the same in their own notebooks using an ancestor of their own or another figure from black history. This is a short activity, but the result would be a powerful visual on how they can learn from the great men and women who have gone before. This makes the topic of, un of the Underground Railroad one that they can now better relate to and connect to. Those early black pioneers to Canada that ran through the woods at night and hid by day, who even at times knelt down and drank rainwater out of the hoof prints of cattle to quench their thirst for freedom and continue on the perilous Underground Railroad to the heaven that they sang about in their songs, namely Canada, have a message for all Canadians in the world today. And that message is that we must leave bitterness behind and work towards mutual respect and reconciliation. Black history education can be used as a vehicle to do just this. Thank, thank you very much, Brittany, and, and certainly we thank our audience for their kind attention because this is uh, dealing with, with serious subject matter when we, we talk about uh, the history of humankind in general, but when we talk specifically about black history, the history of, of an oppressed people. Uh, a people that have risen up and, uh, and made great, great contributions to uh, the world that we live in. And I'd like to uh, focus on a, a, a historical reality uh, that uh, uh, is contained in a quote uh, that I will read by the, it was actually written by the third president of the United States in the latter part of the 1700s, Thomas Jefferson. And I will share this quote with you as follows. The whole commerce between master and slave is a perpetual exercise of the most boisterous passions, the most unremitting depotism on the one part and degrading submissions on the other. Our children see this and learn to imitate it, for man is an imitative animal. This quality is the germ of all education in him, from his cradle to the grave, he is learning to do what he sees others do. If a parent could find no motive, either in his philanthropy or his self-love, for restraining his intemperance of passion towards his slave, it should always be sufficient one that his child is present. But generally it is not. The parent storms, the child looks on, catches a liniment of wrath, puts on the same airs in the circle of little slaves, gives loose to his worst passions, and thus nursed, educated, and daily exercised in tyranny cannot be stamped out. The man must be a prodigy who can retain his manners and morals undepraved by such circumstances. After the teacher reads this quote, from the third president of the United States, as I mentioned, Thomas Jefferson, a lively discussion as to its relevance to students' lives can follow. Another discussion could take place about our great John Gray Simcoe, Harriet Tubman, and others. For example, students can be put in groups and asked the question, can they be influenced by what other people say, including their own parents? and think about people who are different from themselves, in, in, in thinking about people who are different from themselves. And do they think that humankind is still trying to get it right in terms of positive relations between all people of the human, of humankind, not just people of different skin colors? And they can be told that no race, creed, or color can claim that they have uh, hold on the uh, uh, man's inhumanity to man, that we've all sinned and fallen short. We all make mistakes when dealing with others of different races, different faiths. History tells us that. They can also be told that that golden rule, 
of do unto others as you would have them do unto you is just as important today as it was in yesteryear. This underground railroad freedom movement that Simcoe fueled inspired a growing number of people who believed in mutual respect and freedom of all people. I repeat, the Underground Railroad was a neutral history. It did not point fingers. It was the first great freedom movement in the Americas and the first time that good people, black and white, of different races and faiths, worked together in harmony for freedom and for justice. At the John Freeman Walls Historic Site and Underground Railroad Re Museum, we don't sugarcoat history. We tell what happened but we emphasize that humankind's humanity to man rather than inhumanity to man is the focal point of what this particular museum and historic site is all about. And, and we're not uh, uh, the only museum and historic site that, that does this. Stories of black history education and more specifically the Underground Railroad Freedom Movement can connect with students and bring out positive messages that can be made relevant to our world today. Oh yes, we realize that, uh, that facts and figures have their place. We, we certainly can in this, uh, th this early uh, story of black history in, in, in Ontario. Uh, we can tell them that the, the Underground Railroad Freedom Movement began in the latter part of the 1700s, started by Quaker abolitionists. We can expand into the, the, the fact and, and, and figure that by 1823, there were definite routes of the Underground Railroad making their way from the southern United States into the northern uh, United States, and yes, even into Canada, especially after 1850 and the Fugitive Slave Law in the United States, which made it not safe to even be in the northern United States. We can talk about uh, Levi Coffin, you know, who became a very, very important figure in the Underground Railroad Freedom Movement. We could talk about, certainly, Frederick Douglass. We can talk about the, the, the great uh, emancipators. Uh, the, we can talk about the the importance of uh, uh, of us realizing that uh, that as Brittany mentioned earlier that we stand on the shoulders of great men and women that have gone before education in general and black history education specifically can be fun and engaging there are underground railroad field studies destinations throughout the province the Ontario Black History Society and the Ontario Heritage Trust have a list of where they are located. The Ontario Historical Society has on its website under the heading Forging Freedom an in-depth section titled Walls Family History done by the great present-day historian Adrian Shad, a direct descendant of the famous Marianne Shad of Buxton, Ontario. The book Ontario's African Canadian Heritage, the writings of Fred Landon published for the Ontario Historical Society and edited by Dr. Brian Walls, Carolyn Smarts Frost, Hilary Bates Neary, and Professor Frederick H. Armstrong of the University of Western Ontario is also an excellent resource. Now Dr. Walls will take you on a tour of one of the field studies de destinations commemorating black and multicultural history in Ontario. The John Freeman Walls Historic Site and Underground Railroad Museum is located about 20 minutes from Windsor, Ontario, 401 West Exit 28. We will, will be used as a template of how educators can gather more unique black history for their students and for curators visiting to their museums. Certainly, there is a historic site or black history museum where you live. And I certainly will will just a tangent for a moment as we look at the screen and we see the the the, the book Ontario's African Canadian Heritage, which can uh, which the Ontario Historical Society was instrumental in in uh, uh, making certain that it was it was published. And and the the, the great Fred Landon, 1880 to 1969, he was a London librarian and professor 
who was both president of the Ontario Historical Society and one of the first Canadian writers on black history. As both a Great Lakes sailor and journalist, Landon's early development had early developed an interest in the common man. An important part of his writings deals with their lives and are especially relevant for the conference uh, dealing with forging freedom and, and the immigration to, to Canada. You see on your screen an historic plaque. Welcome to the John Freeman Walls Historic Site and Underground Railroad Museum. And this particular historic site uh, happens to be a, a template uh, in, in terms of uh, a family story in the Underground Railroad uh, chapter. But there are many, many other stories that can be referred to in the discussion of uh, uh, the early days of black history uh, in Ontario. And this historic plaque reads as follows. In 1846, John Freeman Walls, a fugitive enslaved from North Carolina, built a log cabin on land purchased from the Refugee Home Society, an organization founded by the abolition the voice of the fugitive and the famous Josiah Hansen. The cabin subsequently served as a terminal of the Underground Railroad and the first meeting place of the Puce Baptist Church. Although many former enslaved returned to the United States following the American Civil War, Walls and his family chose to remain in Canada. The story of their struggles forms the basis of the book, The Road That Led to Somewhere. In way of background, this particular settlement of the, the Underground Railroad in, in Canada, uh, there were 72 families that pioneered here in the early 1900s, enough to support three churches. There was the African Methodist Episcopal Church, but when the, the congregation came to Canada, they were so, I'll use the word, excited and, and, and uh, overwhelmed by this taste of freedom that they actually changed their names. Some of them broke off from the African Methodist Episcopal Church and changed their name from African Methodist Episcopal to British Methodist, Methodist Episcopal because they thought they'd be more protected under the British law in case a slave catcher came up and tried to take them back into enslavement, which unfortunately did happen. And then there was the Baptist Church. The Baptist Church uh, uh, is uh, still standing and, and continues the spiritual continuity of the, of the families of, of those pioneers that, that literally ran through the woods at night and hid by day that thirsted for freedom so much that they would even at times kneel down and drink rainwater from the hoofprints of cattle. And the First Baptist Church Puce is an example of about eight other churches uh, of the Amherstburg Regular Missionary Baptist Association, which is joined with the great, uh, uh, the great Canadian Baptists of Ontario and Quebec, and continues the uh, important work of, uh, of making certain that the spiritual health and well-being of those descendants and certainly others are taken care of. In, in the cemetery, which has over 30 souls buried, there's a tombstone with the marker John and Jane Walls. And this particular historic marker brings out an important uh, in ingredient, if you will, in the, in the story of, uh, uh, of those early black pioneers that came to Canada, a, a multicultural story, because John and Jane Walls, the protagonists of, uh, of the John Freeman Walls Historic Site and Underground Railroad Museum, uh, their story for the time that they were uh, living and, and, uh, and making contributions was stranger than fiction. And I'm going to, to read a little excerpt of a, a letter that was written by a George Whipple. And uh, this information was given to me by my, my good friend, 
Brian Prince of the Buxton National Historic Site uh, in, in Buxton, uh, Ontario, and Kent County, and uh, and I certainly uh, uh, have always enjoyed uh, uh, sharing this fact. The uh, George Whipple was part of the American Missionary Association. He was a minister. Uh, they would send uh, ministers to to Canada to find out uh, and and add fuel to the abolitionist movement to find out how the uh, freedom seekers, these new pioneers to Canada, were doing. And on one of the, his particular visits, he happened to to uh, uh, be driven around by my great-great-grandfather, John Freeman Walls, and he was so intrigued by what he heard that he wrote these words. Tuesday, I returned to Little River riding in a little cart drawn by a small French pony, guided by a Christian gentleman, but not of this church. He's a Baptist. His story's a little peculiar. He's a very black man and was a slave in one of the southern states. After the death of his old master, his mistress came north with him with her children, bringing this man with her. At length, she married him, and the whole family are now living happily together in Canada. He owns a little farm and is out of debt. There's an excellent school at Little River taught by a student from Oberlin, a Mr. Wheeler. He might get a more advanced school and much better wages elsewhere, but is drawn here by his sympathy for an oppressed people. We're looking at the house that John Freeman Walls built on four rocks in 1846. He was a carpenter from North Carolina, and he was so excited about the the land that he, he, he was able to finally own as a free man that he put this the cemetery on the property that I referred to uh, in, the, in the last slide. And a hundred years later, one of the direct descendants of John Freeman Walls and Jane King Walls was uh, my uncle Earl Walls, who was a former Canadian heavyweight boxing champion, third contender in the world, under the great Rocky Marciano. And uh, he is basically saying to students who love sports that uh, because my ancestors traveled in, to freedom in the 1800s, uh, he was able to literally fight his way into the Boxing Hall of Fame and is buried there today. It was his wish. He lived in Toronto for 40 years but it was his wish to come back to the original homestead property and be buried in the ancestral uh, cemetery. And as a heavyweight boxing champion, he was, as I mentioned, third contender in the world under the great Rocky Marciano, and uh, uh, students can look up uh, the heroes of the past and, and feel a sense of pride and determination and realize that, uh, that if they made it, uh, back in those hard times that they certainly can today. And I remember my Aunt Stella Butler. Aunt Stella was the griot of our family. Griot is an African term for keeper of the oral history. And my Aunt Stella told me and other stories of old time day. Uh, Aunt Stella, I purchased the ancestral homestead from her in 1976. She passed away in 1986 at 102 years of age, but her mind was sharp right up until the end. And she told me, she said, Brian, I want you one day to become a modern day griot and, and, and write the story down in, 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 in book form that I'm going to tell you. And one of the things she did is she told me to go into the law cabin and to get a letter and from an old trunk, and I brought it down. And the letter was dated December the 18th, 18, December the 19th, rather, 1854. And it read, Respected members of this opportunity, friends, of writing a few words. There's been right smart of sickness about. Two of our grandchildren die with the flux, and that colored man die with the cholery, and several more that came here to see thee. We have had no account from you, your well-wishing friend Ephraim and Mary Stout. 
and a chill ran up my spine because I realized that this letter that I was holding was letting me know that this story was more important than I had originally thought when I just thought of it from a, a local uh, uh, genealogical perspective. But it was a story that was, a, as, uh, as all many of the, the, the museums and historic sites in Ontario dealing with black history topics, there's, it was like the unfolding of the tomb of Tutankhamun in terms of historical wealth, and it was underscoring that important message of the black history early days that has been, been, been underscored and is coming down to us today in terms of we must continue to keep love in our heart for, for one another. As I mentioned, it's important when you're teaching black history to teach it with your heart as well as your mind. The facts and figures are important, but it's very, very important to make it relevant to your students' lives today. And you can see here at the John Freeman Walls Historic Site and Underground Railroad Museum a false bottom wagon that they would use to make their way from one underground railroad station to another. And this false bottom wagon was, was covered. We have a split rail on there today, uh, but uh, it was covered back in yesterday, uh, yesteryear with manure. And that manure we tell our students who come to the site was used to to help to throw off the scent of the uh, of human scent uh, from the hounds that uh, would often be uh, used to uh, to track down these uh, freedom seekers who were uh, seeking uh, uh, seeking freedom in uh, uh, across the 49th parallel into Canada. This is our building that we have at the site. Uh, in honor of John Gray Simcoe, who I expanded on, on earlier today. John Gray Simcoe Educational Resource Law Cabin uh, is used to, uh, uh, to not only uh, uh, educate the youth in the, the, the significance of what black history was all about, but also we have concerts there. We've had as many as a thousand people come and, and, uh, and, and partake of a, a gospel concert where we sing praises to, uh, to the Lord and give him the glory for, for the freedom that our ancestors enjoyed and that we are beneficiaries of today. It is important when uh, uh, people come to our historic site again to, to realize that, uh, that they stand on the shoulders of great men and women that have gone before in that this history uh, is bringing back a great message, a message of uh, mutual respect and reconciliation. And this is one of our first efforts. This was a, uh, a flatbed rail car, about 50 feet uh, in, in length, and we built on it a, a, a replica of a caboose, indicating that it was a uh, terminal of the Underground Railroad. And then we see a slide of, uh, uh, of my daughter, who uh, you saw the picture of. I'm very proud of her as a, as a teacher uh, with her bachelor's degree in, in elementary school education. But this was her with the great Rosa Parks, who came to our site 14 years, bringing students who she was training in the philosophy of Dr. Martin Luther King. And she felt that the, the, that the, the black history that took place the Underground Railroad Freedom Movement of the 1900s continued into the, the, the Civil Rights Movement of the 20th century. And we would also often get students to, uh, who came by and said that, uh, well, what's this old-time black history stuff have to do with me today? You know, I'm free. I'm not an enslaved anymore. And we would ask them, well, are there any modern-day enslavers? And the feedback would come back, well, drugs. Drugs is a modern-day enslaver. Can steal your joy, take your life away, make your parents very, very disappointed and sad. You know, then there's poor self-esteem. If you don't love yourself, how in the world are you going to love me? And this could be the roots of bullying. And then, of course, violence and hatred. And and certainly, Doc, uh, uh, Mrs. Rosa Parks would talk about the you know the the great Dr. Martin Luther King 
who uh, who has said, and it's just as true in this in the in that today as it was in the 1960s, that there's no longer a choice in our world between violence and nonviolence. It's nonviolence or non-existence. So we're dealing with a, a, a story of black history that has very, uh, very deep roots in, uh, in, in freedom in Canada, that we're all part of that equation. And also, uh, it's, it's a story that, uh, uh, that, that has to uh, give us great inspiration and, uh, and help us during difficult times today. Very humbly yet proudly, uh, in the book *The Road That Led to Somewhere*, uh, I attempt to uh, to talk about the importance of of, of freedom uh, that uh, that our ancestors uh, laid the foundation for, and uh, let us all appreciate the fact that uh, that that we have to continue to to make every effort to uh, let all of those of the rainbow of humankind realize that the importance of black history is not that it's an ethnic history and that that a one particular group is uh, uh, more important than the other, but we all have to appreciate the fact that that we uh, uh, are all in this together and that we're all part of the wonderful uh, rainbow of humankind. And I certainly uh, end with a definition of democracy as it relates to black history today. And uh, one of my heroes was the great Winston Churchill, who said, never, never, never give up. And the importance of democracy, as he defined it, and, and I certainly agree And uh, today, is that we have to be, as uh, citizens in this great country of every race, creed, and color, free from fear and want. We have, to, we have the opportunity to be, be part of the government or to t change the government. And we must be treated fairly, whether we're rich or poor, by the judicial system. This is a deeper significance, if you will, of the importance of the efforts that uh, our ancestors and others made, black and white, uh, of different races and faiths uh, in terms of promoting and, and ennobling black history here in Canada. Educational resources and tools, I'm just going to, as, uh, as I, I hurry to a close, uh, refer to a few in, in re relationship to uh, websites. We encourage you, the audience, to access the Ontario Historical Society Forging Freedom Conference uh, by simply accessing Ontario Historical Society website and bringing up Forging Freedom. Uh, the book by Fred Landon uh, in terms of African Canadian heritage. The websites, uh, Allison will make certain that they're made available to you at a, at a, uh, uh, a timely, on a timely manner. Uh, we also want the uh, the audience to appreciate that they can can uh, access the information about the John Freeman Walls Historic Site and Underground Railroad Museum at, uh, at at our website, and also the Ontario Black History Society uh, information about other important uh, educational resources, and also contact the Ontario Heritage Trust website for a list of all of the historic sites and museums that could be near near them. And uh, more specifically, I refer to the Birdie Hall in Fort Erie, the Buxton National Historic Site and Museum in North Buxton, the Central Ontario Network for Black History in St. Catharines, the Chatham-Kent Black Historical Society, the First Baptist Church, Chatham, Gray Roots Museum and Archives in Owen Sound, the Griffin House National Historic Site in Ancaster, certainly John Freeman Walls Historic Site and Underground Railroad Museum in Essex, Lundy's Lane Historical Museum, Niagara Falls, the Nathaniel Dett Memorial Chapel, 
British Methodist Episcopal Church in Niagara Falls, the North American Black Historical Museum and Cultural Center in Amherstburg, the Oakville Museum in Urk in uh, Urchless Estate in Oakville, Ontario Black Historical Society, Toronto, as mentioned, St. Catherine's Museum at Lock 3 in St. Catharines, Salem Chapel Baptist, Methodist Episcopal Church, St. Catharines, Sandwich First Baptist Church, Windsor, Stewart Memorial Church in Hamilton, and the Uncle Tom's Cabin Historic Site, Dresden, to mention but a few, because this history is just around the corner from your everyday lives. Thank you very much, and God bless you. Thank you very much, Brian and Brittany. Uh, we have just a few minutes left for questions, so if anyone has a question for our two speakers, please use the question feature, and we'll ask them right away. But just to get started, uh, I just wanted to ask you guys, you're both seasoned educators. You've been around a lot of students. You've worked at the museum sites. You've been teaching black history for a number of years. What gets you excited about teaching black history and, and seeing students take it in? Is there anything that makes you excited as a, a, a teacher? Uh, well, Allison, what gets me excited is um, the students' reactions. What gets me excited is the light bulb moments, you know, when they get it, when they, when they make those history to self connections, when you can tell that what you're working so hard to get them to grasp is actually setting in. And those are the moments that I, I really look forward to, which is why I do my best to incorporate black history and even history education, even in cross-curricular ways. It does, it's not something that needs to be uh, kept for just a specific month or a topic. You can even integrate black history in, um, in other subject matter. And I look forward to, yeah, like I said, those light bulb moments. That's what gets me. Um, just wanted to ask one more question. Um, so as I mentioned, both of you are both, uh, you know, veteran educators. You've been around a lot of museum sites. You've probably been to most of the black history sites you mentioned, Brian. Um, and uh, and if not, if not, are friends with most of the people who work at them. <laughs> um, so I'm just wondering, what advice can you offer for other educators who are wanting to go to these sites, how can they prepare their students? And on the flip side, from the museum, having worked at the, your museum for so many years, what can the museum do to, to prepare for students who are coming in and teachers who are coming? What can they do to really help um, make this an easy experience and really an enjoyable one? So kind of you can choose whether you want to speak as an educator or as a museum person, but uh, both are represented in our audience today, so I thought maybe this would be a a good way to end the session. Yeah, here I'll pass it. One of the ways to get your students uh, ready for to visit a black history destination, you have to carefully till the soil. Um, I mean, you have to to prepare prepare them, give them hints as to what they're going to be seeing. Let them see pictures beforehand. Let them see uh, museum mottos. Anything that um, when they're at the site, they'll be able to say, "Oh." I already knew that, which gets them a little more interested in what's happening in the now. Um, at the museum, something that we're going to implement at our museum that we can do for the students is small little question sheets, small small question sheets that as they're going through the museum, they can check off, oh, did I learn this? Did I learn that? And then it, it helps their minds um, create more questions that they'd like to ask during during the process. Thank you. It's Brittany. So unless either of you have anything to add, I think we can wrap up. But we've had a very productive hour here. It's flown by. So I want to uh, just mention that Brian, um, Brian mentioned this in his presentation, but we will be sending an email out to participants this week with a uh, post-webinar evaluation survey, but also the websites that Brian and Brittany recommended everyone check out um, and a number of resources that you can take on and maybe explore. And probably some are familiar, but hopefully there's some new ones that really uh, inspire your, your work. Um, so I just wanted to uh, mention that before we move on. But unless you have anything to add, oh, Brian's going to say one more word. Just a moment. I think you could feel Brittany and my passion for this, and I'm, I'm sorry for the little long-windedness, but we certainly do encourage everyone to to, to not only visit uh, uh, the John Freeman Walls Historic Site and Underground Railroad Museum if it's near to you, but all those other wonderful uh, chapters in the in the uh, uh, early early story of of Black history in Ontario, which continued certainly past the 19. Uh, 1900s into the, the 20th century and then continues even even today. And we certainly ha have uh, uh, 
uh, as a family museum, uh, it's part of our 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 heritage to to certainly uh, invite you to come to the historic site and uh, partake of our uh, our humble summer camps and gospel concerts and uh, uh, a anything that can help to to enrich your 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 hearts and in your minds in the importance of of what the uh, travelers on the Underground Railroad uh, would want uh, us to tell you today, to take courage. Courage isn't something that's given to you, but by an act of faith, uh, our ancestors had to say, Lord, command me to do the impossible. And that impossible was, was literally uh, making it to freedom so that future generations could have the uh, opportunity to make the best of their talents and uh, that poster says it all in terms of uh, uh, the, the innocence of youth. You know, we have to learn how to keep love in our heart for one another. Thank you very much, Allison, and thank you, audience. Thanks very much, Brian. Uh, so I'm just going to say a few words before we sign off today. But uh, I wanted to share, um, as I mentioned, we're sending out some uh, an email tomorrow with a post-webinar survey. We really appreciate if you take a few minutes to provide us some feedback. It really helps us develop future webinars, and hopefully we'll be working with Brittany and Brian again in the future, so watch out for that. Um, you can also contact me directly. I'm Allison Little at alittle at ontariohistoricalsociety.ca. And if you have any comments, suggestions for future web webinars, we'd love to hear them. Um, just a note about our next webinar, on November 25th, the OHS will host Access Beyond the Ramp, and this will examine how Ontario's heritage organizations and institutions can plan for and integrate the principles of access and inclusion, and this is beyond the uh, AODA regulations that are now uh, coming into force as of December, so we really want to um, kind of go beyond that and see what we can do as workers and as educators. This webinar will be led by John Ray, who is the second vice chair of the Council of Canadians with Disabilities. So please visit our website. Uh, registration will open at the end of October, or email me for info on these sessions. Uh, a little bit about membership with the OHS. We really encourage you to become a member of the OHS and the Ontario Black History Society if you're not already. Both organizations offer great support and resources for educators, um, lots of information on upcoming events related to Ontario's heritage uh, community and black history in Ontario. And uh, your support will help both continue to promote the importance of black history and heritage across Ontario in our classrooms, museums, and heritage spaces. So just before we sign off, I'd like to say thank you very much to Dr. Brian E. Walls and Brittany Miles for their excellent work sharing their expertise with us today. And thank you so much to Rosemary Sadlier and Michelle Halsell of the OBHS for helping to coordinate this session. Um, follow the OBHS on Twitter at TweetOBHS. Follow the OHS on Twitter at Ontario History and like us on Facebook. And uh, look out for our next webinars coming up in November and in 2015. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a great day.